Hey everyone, what's going on? It's the Creepy Fox, back with another True Scary Stories podcast. And boy, do I got another good one for you all today. An hour-long edition of True Night Shift Stories that are going to chill you all to the bone. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to go ahead and say thank you very much to everybody that checked out the first episode of the Creepy Fox anime. That starred my characters Arya and Tiana and even me. It was definitely fun working on that with my animator friend Leonardo. He did a really amazing job, so shout out to him. Which, speaking of the episode, I'm happy to let you all know that there's a second little episode coming out. It should be out sometime in September, so keep a lookout for that. And also, if you're a fan of it, uh, you can check out right below the video player. I've got some new merchandise available, and inspired by the animation, and I'll have some new stuff in the next few days. Anyways friends, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Oh, and stay tuned after the last story. Comments with Creepy is officially back, and you don't want to miss it. Anyways, let's get started, shall we? I used to have a job of working at a 24-hour donut shop that was two blocks away from my house. This was during the summer of 2011, and it was in the period between high school graduation and my first semester at my community college, so I was 18 years old. I worked in the evenings, since I tend to be a night owl anyways. Besides, most of my friends had already moved out to pursue their adulthoods and priorities, so it's not like I had anything else going for me at the time. Now, I lived in an average middle American boring town of like 3,000 people, and apart from hearing about a neighbor's farm animal getting out, you didn't really hear about many notable stories, let alone crime. Anyways, there I was on a random weekday and it's around 2 in the morning. Fueling me that evening was my typical combination of donut shop coffee and chocolate sprinkled donut, which quickly went from a sugar rush to a not so sugar rush as I sat there bored looking at my phone and watching highlights from the previous evening's Monday Night Raw. Anyone else here a wrestling fan who remembers the 2011 Summer of Punk? That promo though. Hasn't really been anything like it since. I digress. I noticed a figure walk by the front entrance of the donut shop that looked in for about five seconds before stumbling back into the parking lot and the night. I wasn't really able to get a good look at the person, but judging from what I had gathered, they were wearing a dark red hoodie and red blue jeans, appear to be male, tall and skinny, with a gray beard. It wasn't too common, however, to get customers at this hour but the ones I did were usually police officers or truck drivers as my neck of the woods is a well-known rest town. Anyways, I ignored him as just some random homeless man and I continued back to looking at my phone and grabbing myself another donut. Ooh, I want to say 30 minutes later or so, I went into the bathroom to pee as I had too much coffee and while I'm in there, I hear the sound of the little bell at the front door ring. Honestly, I dreaded it being a customer as I was enjoying my evening of doing nothing and stuffing myself with complimentary greasy goodness. With my hands firmly washed and a splash of cold water in the face to wake me up, I put my hand on the door handle and I instantly got the chills down my spine. I know a lot of times people use that phrase and it's very cliche, but it's so true. It's like for some reason your body's sixth sense kicks in warning you of possible immediate danger, and if you don't get out of the area, you're pretty much a goner. I shrugged off these feelings, however, and step out into the lobby, only to be surprised by what I see. Remember that hooded figure I mentioned from just a little while ago? He's reaching over the counter and he's trying to grab donuts, all without paying. How dare he? I mean, sure, they're just donuts at the end of the day, but considering their CCTV, the owner wouldn't be too happy seeing some random customer trying to feast on this delicious goodness. So I raised my voice like any edgy teenager would and I told the man to back off, further explaining he had to pay for those donuts, otherwise I was going to call the cops. The man turns toward me, and this is when I get a better look at him. His eyes are bloodshot. He's got this look across his face like he's about to go on a rampage, and his movement was very bizarre, something you might see from someone who's on drugs. Without getting another word out, the man suddenly screams and shouts, flopping his arms around like one of those inflatable cartoon balloons you see at car dealerships, 
before, I kid you not, pulling out a knife and then making the motion at his neck indicating he wanted to slash me. He even stated it as well. Freaked out, about to have a panic attack, my legs get a mind of their own as I quickly run back into the restroom, almost shutting the door right on this creep's hands and fingers in the process. What proceeds to follow is about three minutes of the man kicking, screaming, telling me how he was going to kill me, all the while I'm on the phone with 911, begging him there's a madman in the donut shop. Now, luckily since this is a small town, the police station was only about two minutes away from me, so help did arrive fairly quickly, though honestly it seemed like an eternity. Anyways, the man had exited the store when police arrived, but luckily they were able to apprehend him just a couple of minutes later, as they found him in the alleyway behind the donut shop. In short summary, the guy was on drugs, as I had predicted, and he was in no way coherent of where he was, or what he was doing. I had heard he was jailed, but he was let out a short time later. I quit a few weeks after that incident, and after another month or so of summer break, I proceeded to attend community college before moving to California to get my degree at a university in finances. Life has since treated me fairly well, with a decent paying job, a beautiful wife, and two lovely daughters who I just introduced your channel to. They really like the animation stuff you're doing with Aria Rose, and I picked up a couple of stickers for them, which they put on their binders for school. So hey, some free advertising for your animation. Anyways, that's my story submission. Really hoping you'll get more of your subs to send in stories, as I love sitting down with my coffee and listening to these podcasts. Stay safe, Creepy Fox, as well as fellow Creepy Fox listeners. Hi Creepy Fox, I've been listening to you since you started back in 2017, and it's a tradition every time you upload to get myself a sandwich from Subway with a bag of chips. Then I'll sit in my room and listen to your narrations while I work on my artwork. Definitely relaxing, and I couldn't have gotten through some of the art commissions I've worked on without your wonderful voice. I mention art commissions as it's a little business I've worked on over the years, and I do pretty okay considering I'm now in my late 40s, and I do have some problems with my knees. Which, if I could quickly bring up, I saw the video you posted on your Instagram account earlier this week of you finally being able to walk after months of recovery from your total knee replacement. That's really inspiring, man. You're doing great. Anyways, enough about what I do today. The reason I'm writing this in is because I heard you were in need of stories, and I wanted to share a creepy experience of mine from my 20s, back in the late 1990s. And oh boy, what a different time. Life seemed to be a little more relaxed. People actually talked to one another, and any time you said hello to someone with a kind smile and a wave on the street, the other person didn't just awkwardly look down at their phone and ignore you like you're from another planet. That's why when I was working at a gas station that my dad's friend owned, I befriended every customer who would show up. Whether it be the regulars or families that were on a road trip, you best believe I welcomed them with a smile and a kind message of well-being and well-health. Such was a warm summer's evening. I was working the night shift, and I had just clocked in after taking over from my previous co-worker, who we're going to call Charlie. That night, I remember I was pretty stressed due to having to study for multiple midterms. So in between helping customers, I take a look down at my textbook, and I try to memorize the information that was given to me by my professor. Fast forward to around 11 p.m., I started at 8 p.m. A couple of skater college students who were regulars showed up to pick up their tradition of nachos, hot dogs, and sodas. They greeted me hello as they head to the back of the store to pick up their goodies. So no more than two minutes passed that the regulars arrived, and a man walked into the store acting very paranoid and wild too. He kept looking back and forth out into the parking lot and then back at me. I did get a little confused and wary by him, but regardless I welcomed him in with a smile and a hello before telling him if that there was anything I could help him with to please let me know. I then returned to my notes. 20 seconds later, while looking at some flashcards, the man approaches my station. 
and then I see a sharp knife right in front of my eyes. I quickly jump back, hitting a small trash bin and almost falling over in the process. Before looking up at the man, who has got a crazed look in his eyes. The man proceeds to demand I empty out the cash register, and to do it fast otherwise I was going to be in a world of hurt. What other choice did I have? It's not like I had a weapon, and even if I tried to run, there could have been a possibility I tripped, or maybe he could have caught me. And then of course there's the two customers. Well, after about 10 seconds, which honestly felt like an hour, I noticed the two regulars sneaking down one of the aisles of chips, slowly making their way toward me and the crazed man. In that moment, I saw one of them signal toward me to be quiet while the other is holding up his skateboard, which was then used a few moments later to smack the knife out of the man's hand. Never before in my life had I ever seen anyone hit another human being so hard with a skateboard. Now, in what was one quick swoop, the two dive for the knife before the criminal had a chance to retaliate and reach for the weapon. Now, with the situation presumably under control, the creep takes off, heading into the parking lot, before finally disappearing, never to be seen again. Well, that was until a few days later. The man was arrested trying to break and enter into a vehicle, and he was identified via CCTV cameras that had caught him just a few days earlier. As you'd expect, I was very thankful for those regulars, and they told me it was the least they could do, for their gas station convenience store friend. Although it was a huge risk, mind you, but their courage has forever been engraved in my memory and my mind. That's why I mentioned the whole thing about being nice to people. You never know if you'll ever be in a situation like this of life and death. You want to make sure you have friends who can help you. Of course, if that's if they're there. So yeah, be kind to one another and look up from that phone and say hello to people. You'd be surprised. There's a lot of nice people in this world. It's just a matter of saying hello. Thanks for listening, and take care, friends. I worked at my local Walmart from 2007 to 2009, and I oftentimes worked in the evenings, as I went to college during the mornings. It wasn't the most amazing job, just your typical cashier work, but at least it gave me some experience with customer service, and learning to be very, and I mean very patient with people. While 9 times out of 10 customers were kind and went about their shopping like a normal human being, you had the ones who came into the store already in a mood. One wrong look and you set them off, which leads to a series of this and that and how we're the worst employees in the world and that we should think about the customer. <laughs> Gotta love those people. But here's the thing, while I did have my fair share of angry customers and a couple of creepy ones them being older men trying to hit on this 20 year old college girl. There was one encounter in particular that I remembered the most, mainly because it started off as just another routine shift. There I was in my little station, tired from a long day of lectures and learning about rocks and minerals in geology class, trying to keep awake with the music playing over the intercom radio, and talking with my co-workers. I recall it being a slower than usual Friday night. The evening rush had already passed us, and finally in what seemed like forever, my break had arrived. This time around, I'd brought food from home to eat. My mom had packed me some leftover chicken pasta, but unfortunately in my rush to get to work, I had left my food in my car. Thank goodness it was a cold evening, because the last thing I needed was for my food to spoil in a hundred degree weather. Now bear in mind, when I step out of Walmart, it's dark outside. There is a decent amount of vehicles in the parking lot but I'm parked next to the parking lot light towards the very end of the Walmart building. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary as I approach my Volkswagen Beetle Bug. I take out my key and then bend in and reach into my back seat. Aha, uh -huh, there's my food. Just a quick grab, go, warm up, eat it really fast, and I get to go back to my shift. But here's when things start to go wrong. Before I have a chance to back out of my passenger side, I heard footsteps approaching. Assuming it was a customer who had just parked and was going to walk past me, I didn't really think much of it. That was until I looked up through the front window, and lo and behold, there is a man with one of the creepiest smiles I had ever seen. Hey, do you have any money on you? He asks, all the while keeping his hands in his pocket and appearing to be fiddling with something. No, I don't. Sorry. 
I tell him slightly annoyed, hoping he would get the idea and leave me alone. Sadly, that didn't happen, as he just stands there staring until he decides to escalate the already uncomfortable situation. He grabs my arm as I'm pulling out of my passenger seat, and then he attempts to pull me closer to him. It's at this moment I get a huge whiff of alcohol. Well, you see, in the time I was preparing to leave the safety of my vehicle, I didn't stay in there since I needed to get back to my shift. I had reached for the pepper spray that was in my pocket attached to my keys. So, with reflexes of a cat, I sprayed the man straight on in the face, and what follows is him screaming, shouting, and yelling vulgarities at me. I mean, I did just pepper spray the man, but it's what he does next that sends me running. Remember how I said he was fumbling around with something in his jacket pocket? Turns out the creep was carrying a switchblade, as he then begins to chase after me, telling me he was going to kill me. Bear in mind what I had just done, but thank the lord I waved down a customer who happens to hear me, and in what was an act of true bravery, honestly he didn't have to do it. He actually risks his own safety by tackling down the would-be attacker, not before getting a few scratches on his arm in the process. Now, what I didn't know in that moment was my hero was a retired marine, who just so happened to show up to the Walmart at that time to pick up some diapers for his granddaughter. Well, needless to say, the police were called, and the man who seemingly came out of nowhere asking for money, but then tried to grab me for who knows what reasons, was handcuffed and arrested. He was found in possession of that switchblade, and even a small Ziploc bag with a white powdery substance, aka coke. So to say I was given nightmare fuel and scared to leave my house for a while would be an understatement of the century. It really changed me a lot, and even all these years later, I'll sometimes think about it and think, what would have happened had I not had the pepper spray? Or, what would have happened had it not been for the retired marine? One can only imagine. But the good news is I've never had anything like this ever happen to me, ever again. Hey creepy fox, I'm a fan of yours from Mexico and I really love what you do. As I went to university and studied English, I had begun studying here since high school. I found you randomly one day and started listening. Hearing you narrate actually has been very relaxing, and you've helped me practice my English. So I wanted to start off by thanking you. With that out of the way, I got a story to share that happened to me last year, before all the major lockdowns that I think you and your audience will get a kick out of. It's a story that'll remind you that it doesn't matter where you might be, the time, or place. There are always constant dangers, just ready to butt into your normal life. So for some context, I'm a 30-year-old male, and I work for a hotel slash resort in the city of Puerto Vallarta that's in the state of Jalisco, just in case you're wondering. I believe I have heard a story or two on this channel from creepy experiences in Puerto Vallarta, and it sucks to think that this is a really nice city, especially by the ocean side. Anyways, I've been working here for over 10 years, and I've seen it all. People streaking across the pool area, people getting into fights for the dumbest reasons, and even this one time I had a guest yell at me because they didn't like me telling their kids they couldn't climb on the rock formations. I mean, don't blame me when they fall and hit their heads. Anyways, on this particular night, it's about 1am, and the party the hotel was hosting was wrapping up for the evening and coming to a close, as people were finally beginning to return to the rooms. I was pretty much just standing around and helping the cleanup crew put away chairs and tables, when, out of the blue, a guest comes running up to me. Is everything okay? I asked the woman, who was out of breath and panicking, like she had just came face to face with a man-eating shark. There's a guy yelling at the ladies at the front desk, and he's saying how he's going to kill everyone. Admittedly, it was pretty shocking to hear those last few words from her mouth, but remember, I see it at all, so I thought. Therefore, as I'm making my way over to the front lobby, I finally get the call over the radio concerning the crazed guest. They describe him as drunk and acting erratically, and the front desk woman said he was tossing some of the displays around. I asked if she had called the police, and they said they were already on the way, but that they were scared he might try to do something while they got there. Well, considering I've already dealt with drunks in the past, I soon arrived at the front lobby to approach the man and ask him if he was okay. 
His drunken rage suddenly comes to a stop for a brief moment as he just stops and stares at me before calling me every name in the book. Can I really say the things he told me? I guess I'd rather not risk you getting into trouble. So let's just say you wouldn't be caught dead telling your grandmother those sorts of words. Regardless, I'm doing my best to calm him down. And just as it seems he's got to the point, he grabs a shard of a broken vase he tossed to the ground and comes charging at me with a look of complete hatred. Fight or flight immediately kicked in, and I recall everything in those moments going into slow motion. Was I really about to face a drunken man who's got a hold of this sharp object? What if he managed to connect on my neck or any other sensitive area? Would I ever see my wife and kids again? All of this and more is flashing into my head as my adrenaline pumps me up to dodge out of the way just as he's about to slash at my face. I then proceeded to jump behind him before putting him into an improvised chokehold and bringing him to the ground. A couple of guests seeing the commotion came to help me seconds later and we kept him restrained there on the lobby floor while cops arrived a few moments later. Admittedly, I was pretty shaken up by the entire crazy situation, but I managed to relax once the man was handcuffed and taken away in the police cruiser. The receptionists at the front desk thanked me and the guests, and I told them I was just doing my job and that I was happy they were safe. The police officers also complimented the guests and I on our bravery, and even the manager of the hotel gave me a little plaque thanking me for my service. I was just very lucky that things went the way they did. The last thing I would have wanted was an untrained guest or employee to get physically involved and then get sent to the hospital, or worse, because they try to de-escalate the situation. Anyways, if my story manages to make its way into a Creepy Fox podcast, I want to say thank you and also let people listening know you should look into getting training in self-defense. Sure, as a security guard, it's pretty much needed, but it doesn't hurt to have it on your resume. It might just save you, and those around you. In the mid-2000s, back in high school, I used to babysit on the weekends as a part-time job for a really nice family that lived down the road from me. The couple, who at the time were in their late 30s, I had two daughters who were aged 8 and 5 respectively. What I enjoyed the most about babysitting for that family was they always treated me like I was their daughter, making me food, inviting me to their parties and get-togethers, and they were even nice enough to give me a thousand dollars along with a really nice card when I graduated from college years later. I still talk to them all these years later by the way, and I'm good friends with their kids. Well, not kids anymore, but you get the idea even though I've since moved out of state. Anyways though, not a typical night shift story, let's say if I were to store or any other job. This did occur in the evening however, and while I was working and babysitting, so it still counts. So there I was, in my room watching TV and eating snacks, when I got a call from that family asking if I could come over and babysit the kids the next day, as well as spend the night. The reasoning was some close friends of theirs had invited the pair to a casino slash hotel a couple of hours away as they had free rooms, and they really wanted to go since they hadn't seen those friends in years. Naturally, this meant they needed me, so without hesitation, I agreed and the plans were set. The next afternoon, close to 3pm, I walked down the street and got greeted by the kids coming up to me and giving me a huge hug. The mom and dad thanked me again for being able to come over last minute and I told them it wasn't really a problem since I had no other plans. With the introductions out of the way, they invited me in and we had some pizza from Domino's before an hour later, mom and dad leave and it's just me and the kids. Nothing extraordinary happens in the next few hours, just me playing with the kids in the backyard and going into the front and drawing with chalk on the driveway. I'd say close to 7pm however, I noticed something a little strange, which at first I just wrote off as my paranoia. A black SUV drove down this street very slowly and then ended up stopping straight across from us. Bear in mind, they never did turn the car off, the car was running the entire time. Though to be fair, this was in the summer, so I assumed they had just had their air conditioning on and didn't want to worry about the heat. Anyways, 10 minutes pass and I never saw anyone get out, which for some reason raised some alarms in my head. 
Guess that's what happens when you watch so many scary movies. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, the car drives away and I write the whole incident off as just some person going out for an afternoon drive and stopping to take a break. Yeah, it's not the best explanation, but it's what I came up with. Fast forward to around 10 p.m., and the kids are just about ready to head into their rooms and get some shut-eye. We were in the living room, mind you, watching Spongebob on DVD, and this is when the kids ask me if I could make them some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I happily agreed considering I wanted to make something as well as I still wasn't sleepy and I was getting pretty hungry anyways. So I head into the kitchen as the kids lay on the couch and while I'm at the sink, I just so happen to look into the kitchen window that overlooks the front yard. What I noticed was that same black SUV from a few hours ago parked directly across the street from me. Again, I never saw anyone get out and I actually joked to myself that they were staking out the house and getting ready to go on a burglarizing rampage. Hey, I can't be the only one who tries to make light of creepy and bizarre situations, right? It's sort of your brain's way of dealing with stress. Nonetheless, I prepare the sandwiches, and about three minutes later I look back out the window. The black SUV is gone. Hmm, very weird. Once again, we fast forward a few hours later. I'm finally starting to get sleepy and I'm on the couch watching Adult Swim at about 1am. This is when I heard a really strange noise coming from one of the back rooms. I'll tell you, that house echoed like you were in some sort of cave, which is why I heard those audible cues. Sounds of scratching and something moving. I thought perhaps the kids had woken up and must have been playing, so I sighed and start heading toward their room to check. A quick side note, I haven't mentioned this yet. But this is a two-story home, and the kids' room is on the second floor. I promise this is important. Anyways, when I get to their room, they are fast asleep, and the noises aren't stopping from downstairs. Now I'm starting to get a bit creeped out, so I peek into the hallway, and it's at this moment my body goes cold. I hear a door opening very slowly. I don't know how I kept my composure, or how I didn't scream, but my number one concern was someone had just broken in. Instinctively, I locked the door and then took out my cell phone to call 911. But here's the thing. As I'm explaining the situation, I ended up peeking out through the kid's window. It also overlooks the front yard and driveway. I'm shocked to see the same black SUV is parked in front of the house. It's at this moment the harsh reality of my joke hits me. This house is getting burglarized, and I'm stuck in this room with the kiddos who are fast asleep. Dare I wake them up and startle them, thus notifying the burglars? Even if I don't, they're going to try opening the bedroom door, and who knows what they'll do at that moment. Best scenario, they give up and move on with their burglar spree. Worst scenario, they kick the door down, and from there, who knows? I chose the harsh reality telling them there were some people in the house, but for no reason whatsoever were they to make a single noise or to scream and yell. How I had to try so hard to tell them this news with the most straight face I could muster up, one that was holding back tears and screams. Fast forward about a minute, and we hear the sounds of footsteps making their way up the stairs. I begged the dispatch lady on the phone for cops to get here. She confirms they're on the way, and that we are to remain calm. Easy for her to say, but to be fair, we are the ones here. In what was an absolute miracle, we see red and blue lights flashing through the windows just moments later, as the door handle of the bedroom begins to violently shake. I hold back tears and the kids are looking at me through the closet I tell them to hide in, as something comes over me and I decide to open the window. Police, help, someone's in the house. The door handle stops, and I hear two people whispering something along the lines of, I call the police. Quick, run! Police officers managed to catch the two just as they are running out of the back door, and we ended up finding out that they were actually pretty young and inexperienced, some dudes in their early 20s. Now what made things scarier was that one of the burglars had a BB gun, and the other had a knife. Safe to say, I was very thankful for those police officers 
who told me they were already in the area doing an evening patrol when they got the call. That explained their record arrival. Anyways, I called the parents to explain what had happened, and they drove back almost immediately, arriving within an hour and a half. Now, the thanks was given to me, and they couldn't stop saying how I was a hero for keeping their little ones safe. So, that pretty much brings a close to my submission. To clear some things up, the burglars had broken in through a back door, which unfortunately had problems closing properly. Not that I should have had to worry about that. I mean, why should anyone have to worry about the potential of getting robbed? No one, not even my worst enemy should have to experience something like this. Wouldn't you agree? This also occurred in a very safe neighborhood where crime was never heard of. Oh, and yes, that black SUV? That belonged to them. And as I mentioned prior, saying that it was an important detail, we were on the second floor. So it's not like we could have gone out the window, as there was no cushioning the fall. Being a bartender, you're used to dealing with people all the time. I chose the job because the bar I applied to was well known for pretty chill customers, and considering it's rock and roll themed, it was perfect with my love of music. That and because I would always go there with friends. Anyways, I'm still there today and I enjoy a pretty nice balanced schedule, consisting of Monday to Friday afternoons and evenings. I don't think I need to tell you, however, how bad it was for our industry in 2020. But since that's behind us, I'd rather not get into it. This incident in particular just happened fairly recently. I'm not sure when you're going to include this in a video, but I'm writing this up about a week after it took place. So anyways, it was on a random Wednesday weekday evening, and it's me and one other bartender on a relatively slow shift. Aya was serving up drinks and having conversations with a couple of regulars that I had befriended over the love of the band All Time Low. The bar was around 25% its capacity, and you could see some customers sitting at tables spread apart in the dining area, having fun, sharing laughs, and enjoying delicious food. While I'm enjoying my shift, my co-worker Jennifer is having the complete opposite emotion. She was feeling pretty low that evening as her boyfriend of two years had left her for her best friend. Really messed up if you ask me, considering she's become almost like family to me so you bet I was trying to cheer her up and get her to smile. It worked at some point, but I think it was because she didn't want to make me feel bad. Well, after my friends left, the time is now roughly 11.15pm, and we're set to close early at midnight. The bar is slowly approaching emptiness, and now there's only two guys at the bar having drinks and laughing. At this point in my employment there, I had never seen them before. Now, one thing I couldn't help but notice as I'm looking at my phone, was that they kept making remarks about Jennifer. Some normal, some not so normal. Remarks that I'd rather not share here since they were pretty gross. Anyways, what really set off Jennifer and I as well, was when she tried serving them a drink, and the larger of the two men grabs her arm and tries to pull her close to his face for a kiss. I got so mad, as I yell at the man to let go, as Jennifer jumps back in complete shock. The man suddenly stands up, in what looks to be a drunken state, and tells me what in the world was I going to do about it. Now again, I have been working as a bartender for quite some time, so I know how to de-escalate situations. I remember telling Jennifer to go get the security at the front, as I told the man that behavior like that was unacceptable, and if he didn't calm down, I was going to have to ask him to leave. The creep starts to laugh, and then begins name calling me, trying to get me to fight him as his friend starts to cheer him on. Ugh, just relax, Stephen, I tell myself in my head, saying Ralph, our security guard, would get here and stop these two creeps. Oh, and just a quick mention, our security guard's nickname is Ralph. Yeah, from Wreck-It Ralph, because he loves that movie. Plus, he's the kindest and sweetest person you'll ever meet. Just don't get him on his bad side. He's very protective of all of us just like Ralph is protective of his friends in the movies. For some context on Ralph, he has been a bouncer at multiple clubs over the years, and he's a pretty hefty and fit dude. 270 pounds, 6 foot 5 of pure muscle man. That's why you don't want to mess with him. At any rate, 
Before Ralph has a chance to get to me, the creep actually starts to vault over the bar counter, and then once he's over, he grabs one of the mug glasses and starts to shout. I begin to back up as he begins throwing that glass mug at me, trying to hit me presumably in my head. A customer who was just coming out of the restroom sees the commotion and runs to help me, just as Ralph and Jennifer enter the room. After a small exchange and a struggle, with Ralph being able to easily manhandle the creep, the man ends up collecting his bearings by getting up, before running out of the bar with his pal. Those two never did return, and it's safe to say the butt whooping they got from Ralph, as well as the embarrassment, is what made them learn their lesson. So maybe it's not the scariest thing in the world, but try to put yourself in my shoes. I'm a pretty short height for being a dude, 5 foot 11, 175 pounds. Both these guys were about 6 foot, 230 to 240 pounds each. Yeah, thank the lord nothing like that has happened at our bar again. And as for Jennifer, she's doing a lot better now. She found a new guy and he's super cool. I'm best friends with him and myself and my girlfriend Amber will go on double dates with him when we're not working. I work for an authentic Mexican taqueria that's open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in Southern California. We're located near the downtown area, which means on the weekends when I work at night, we often get the drunks who come in to get food. Though quite often than not, they're more hilarious than they are aggressive. There was this one time I was working, however. A customer came in and yelled at my co-worker in a drunken state, claiming he was sleeping with his girlfriend but it quickly de-escalated when a couple of his friends managed to calm him down. Crazy enough, the same guy came in the next day and apologized to my co-worker, which is something you almost never hear about happening. So anyways, I'm riding in to go over a wild encounter that I just had a few months ago when I was working the night shift. That evening, I had been fairly busy when I had first clocked in at 9pm. Customers were arriving in large groups to get their food game on, and I was happily helping make the tacos along with my two other co-workers who were going to call Kevin and Carlos. Now, as it was approaching 2 in the morning, it was time for my lunch, so I decided to head to my car parked in the back of the building to eat some tacos de lengua I had prepared and to watch an episode of Yu-Gi-Oh, which I was re-watching for like the fifth time on my phone. I actually remember which episode I was watching. It was the one where Merrick had mind-controlled Joey and he was dueling Yugi with that anchor high above them. Anyways, that's not too important. Halfway through the episode, downing the tacos with some ice cold fresh horchata, I hear a bump on the passenger side window. I was so focused on my phone that I actually jumped up scared like a little kid when I heard the noise. Standing there was a tall skinny man with no shirt on and the scruffiest beard I'd ever seen. His hair was all nappy and it looked as if he hadn't showered in weeks. I recall making a hand gesture like I was waving at him while letting out a nervous chuckle, thinking perhaps he was going to leave me alone once he saw the car was occupied, but he continues to stand there. Well great, so much for enjoying my food and this episode. As I'm sitting there thinking about what I'm going to do next, he then attempts to open the door, but as you'd expect, it's locked. Try and try as he did, he then moves on to the back doors, but he's unsuccessful. Well, great. What was this guy's problem, I thought. Bang. Bang. I hear at the back bumper, as my car then begins to move. Oh, no way was he hitting my car. I looked through the rearview mirror, and sure enough, he was kicking at it. I got so mad, that just as I'm about to reach for the door to open it, I saw something that sent a chill down my spine. The crazed man had taken out a small knife and was beginning to slash my tires. I can't tell you how scared I got, as panic starts to induce a sort of frozen state of mind, where for whatever reason, I couldn't move. I don't really know how to best explain it, so let me just say that unless you're in a situation such as this, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. After sitting there frozen in what felt like hours, I decided to call my co-workers who were in the store, but they didn't answer, not that I was surprised. Yes, I did end up calling the cops right after that, but as I was waiting, the man kept banging at my door, 
saying that if I didn't open up, he would get in by force and take the car away from me. Yeah, I did tell you he was pretty out there, didn't I? Thankfully, as he begins to walk away, presumably giving up, two police cruisers pull up into the parking lot and then I notice the man takes off running. This was when I stepped out of my vehicle and I told the police officers that was the man who was trying to break into my car with a knife. Fast forward about five minutes later and they're bringing the man back to the parking lot in handcuffs. By this point everyone inside the restaurant had come out to see what the commotion was about since mind you at the time there was only one customer eating and then my two co-workers who had no clue as to what was happening. At the end of it all he was taken away and I sighed a breath of fresh air knowing that my ordeal had finally come to an end. A few days later I uncovered that the man was well known in the downtown area for being a druggie and just so happened to have stumbled into our neck of the woods on that evening. Why he was trying to break into my car as I was eating? I guess whatever he was on told him to, but luckily he was unsuccessful. I'm still working there, but I haven't had anything crazy like this happen to me again. But hey, if I have another story to share in the future, I'll make sure to send it your way creepy fox, since you're my favorite narrator. Take care, be safe, and all the best with your recovery on that leg of yours. When you're back at Disney, I'll make sure to come by one day and say hello so I can introduce you to my girlfriend and her sister, who really enjoy your videos too. I'm a retired bus driver who now spends his days looking after his grandchildren and relaxing on the backyard porch watching my bird feeder and listening to music. One thing I discovered was your channel, and as someone who enjoys scary stories, I thought I'd write up one of my crazier experiences that I had when I was younger. We're going to rewind all the way back to the late 1980s when I was a young and naive college student. I had been in need of money badly, so I landed a job working as a bus driver after my dad's friend had recommended it to me one day. Little was I to know what would be a summer job would be an entire career. To say I love driving would be an understatement. Anyways, this was about six months into the job, and by that point I'd already gotten used to long hours as I worked in the evenings. Seeing as I worked in the downtown Los Angeles area, I saw many different crowds of individuals. Such was one person in particular that to this day, I'll never forget. So it was about 11 at night and I was making the rounds near LAX airport, picking up passengers left and right and enjoying a cool autumn's evening. When the bus was a solid 70% capacity and almost everyone from what I recall was sitting quietly either looking out the window or reading a book. It was nice and relaxing until I reached a certain bus stop, one that was next to a Chevron gas station. I remember by that point, well, let's say midnight now, the bus capacity had dropped to about 10%. So anyways, I recall picking up two guests, a woman in her early 30s and another man who appeared to be homeless. But here's the thing, as the woman approached me to pay, she whispered to me that the homeless man had been following her for the last little while and she was hoping I would say or do something. As I hadn't actually seen anything take place, there wasn't much I could do. So I told her just to take a seat behind me and I'll make sure to keep an eye on him. Besides, I also assumed since there were a few people on the bus, this man wouldn't try anything. Remember, this is a time before cell phones were available to the public, so even if I wanted to, I couldn't call the cops to check up on the man. Yeah, for those of you who weren't around before cell phones, life was very different. Not that I should have to really tell you. At any rate, the bus ride goes unhinged for the next 20 minutes and more and more passengers are leaving. All that's left by this point is the woman I mentioned and that homeless man who was sitting at the very back of the bus. The good news was it appeared as if whatever was going on between the two was no longer an issue. However, I was too soon to write him off because just as we had arrived at the woman's stop, I heard her scream at the top of her lungs. For the few seconds I had looked away, I looked back up in the mirror to see the man grab the woman's purse and then he starts to book it to the back door. Now I have no idea what came over me in that moment, but it's like adrenaline just took over. I quickly jumped out the bus and then I start to give chase to the man who was running across the street to an empty Walmart parking lot. 
I managed to tackle the man down to the ground and grab the woman's purse, but it's when I get up that the whole situation turns scary. He pulls out a knife from his boot, and then he tells me to hand over the purse. I'll admit, that was one of the scariest moments of my life, and I thought to myself that if I had already come this far, I wasn't going to let this creep get away. But what am I going to do? I chose to run, and yes, there's going to be one person out there that's going to say, why did you run away, you big chicken? I don't know. You come face to face with a crazed man with a knife and you tell me what you're going to do. Anyways, I'm running back to the bus where the woman is staring at me from the windows. I'm desperately trying to yell at her to run away, but I guess she was so frozen in fear she stood in place. To be honest, I was expecting a fight to take place. However, when I looked back for a brief moment, I saw the man no longer give chase to me. He just stood in the parking lot staring at me with a look of complete anger. I don't know what happened in those moments but it's like something must have clicked in his head. Something like, maybe this isn't worth it, because that was it. I locked the doors, and then I end up driving the woman a few streets down, closer to where I knew where there was a police station. This was one of the benefits of being a bus driver. You learn pretty quickly where all the major landmarks are. In short summary, the police officers ended up driving the woman home, and we did give our statements before I returned back to the main bus station to report everything to my higher-ups. As far as I know, he was never caught, and I never saw the man again. I don't know where that woman is today, but if there for whatever reason is a small chance she listens to these podcasts here on the Creepy Fox, or someone she knows listens, then I just want to relay the message that if you remember me, then I hope you're doing well. Thanks for sharing my story. Story time. Sweet. But before I get into this crazy experience, I want to take a moment to describe myself and my profession in a couple of sentences. I'm male, 29 years old, and I'm 6 foot 4, around 270 pounds. As of this writing, I'm still working as a security guard for an old refinery out here in Essex, United Kingdom. Now the only reason I mention details about myself is because I'm the kind of person who doesn't really get scared or intimidated by others. On the contrary, my presence alone seems to intimidate others. Though, as my closest friends know, I'm the nicest person you'll ever meet. Anyways, did I mention I had a crazy story to tell? Yeah, I sure do. I just hope this doesn't upset your expectations, however. This was in 2015. So, my job as a security guard at this refinery is pretty simple. I sit in my little station which was at the entrance of the refinery, and I checked delivery drivers in who came to drop things off. Sometimes they'll even pick up, but those details aren't too important. It was a month ago, and there I was on the night shift with my co-worker George. We're pretty good friends, and so we were just there listening to a wrestling podcast while looking at the monitors, and this is when we notice a figure in one of the cameras. Here's the thing. This camera was inside the refinery. No one at 3 in the morning should be in there. Finding this odd, we changed the view to another camera inside, as we thought we were just seeing a shadow. But then we happened to see the same figure, but from a different angle. It was now obvious. This was no shadow, but a person, as we could see them walking down the corridors. George now calls the boss, and I volunteer to go check in the building. While walking over, I checked to see if any doors were left open, but none were. I mentioned this because these doors have alarms and they were set to go off had they not been opened with a keycard. Anyways, when I reached the back of the refinery, I happened to see a window that was slightly opened ajar. Aha, uh -huh, that had to be how they got in. So I unlocked the door, with my keycard of course, and I proceed to check. As I shine my flashlight down the aisles of produce and boxes, I'm calling out. Hello? Is anyone in here? This is private property. You have to leave. Now. No response. After walking for five minutes, I radio George and I tell him, Hey, I don't see anyone. Have you caught any activity on the cameras? No, I haven't seen the person ever since you left. Okay, well I'll keep checking. Call me back if you see any activity. Moments after, I end the call. Something hits my back so hard that I fell to the ground. I looked up and 
There is this homeless man with a slightly bent crowbar. He tries to get me again, but I roll out of the way and manage to dodge him. Sir, put that thing down now. You need to leave. Bear in mind, the adrenaline was covering the nasty pain I just received. No, I don't think so. This is my home. You leave. This man was clearly not all there. Thus, I back up even more and reach for my pepper spray. Sir, don't you dare get any closer. I'm warning you. Well, even after all those warnings, I had no choice but to spray him. But this didn't phase him. He continues swinging like a madman and runs toward me. He manages to get my arm pretty badly, and I did need some stitches, but I was able to wrestle the crowbar out from his grasp. Seconds later, I hear George rushing in with our boss who had just arrived. George is able to assist me with subduing him, and our boss calls police officers. When all was said and done, the man was arrested. For the longest time, we weren't sure how he got inside the refinery since we have fences everywhere. But after inspecting them, we did find someone had created an opening where they could have easily crawled in. The opening was next to some shrubbery. Thus, it would have been impossible to see had we not gone over to investigate. Anyways, that's pretty much it. I'm still working there, by the way. I work at a small grocery store in the Pacific Northwest. The only reason I'm not revealing the name of the store is for privacy reasons, so I hope you understand. That doesn't mean I'll leave any details out of what happened. Now, the city I live in isn't exactly the greatest, but it's not the worst either. The only reason I give it that bad label is because, for whatever reason, we've been getting a lot of weirdos. I'm talking about the druggies. I put that in air quotation marks since I'm pretty sure you know what I mean by that. We've had a deal with needles being left outside and empty bottles around the premise, and we even had this one time where one of them tried to break into the store. I wasn't working that night, but apparently it wasn't too big of a deal. Anyways, on this evening, I was outside cleaning and pushing the shopping carts, and all was going pretty good. At one point, I actually helped out a lost child, and I was able to reunite him with his mom, so that was pretty nice. However, not even an act of kindness would prepare me for the creepy encounter I was to have. So it's almost closing time and myself and another co-worker, who we're going to call Timothy, were getting all the shopping carts and pushing them to the front of our store. It seemed as if we had all of them, but while scanning the parking lot, I was able to see one peeking out from behind a car. Timothy offers to go and grab it, but I tell him I'd take care of it. What could go wrong? So there I am peacefully walking over. All I was able to think about was the pizza I was going to buy to reward myself after a long work week. Once I arrive at the vehicle, I see two things. The shopping cart and a homeless man drinking. He sees me and he says hello and I greet him back thinking nothing else. However, when trying to pull the shopping cart away from him, he pulls it back and gets mad. The conversation ends up going something like this. Hey, that's mine. Give it back. Yeah, I'm sorry, sir, but this shopping cart belongs to the store. Fine, whatever. Hey, do you have any money you can lend by any chance? Sorry, I don't have anything. He then looks me up and down for about 10 seconds, and he says, Never mind. I think you'll do. I laugh in confusion as I once again tell him I needed the shopping cart back. He gets up, stumbles through his pocket for a few seconds, and then he takes out a small knife. He then starts walking toward me with a creepy smile, and I took this opportunity to run. He gives chase as I scream out to Timothy who is talking to one of the security guards. They both see me, and they immediately jump into action. However, seeing the sight of these two football-sized co-workers of mine, the creep does a complete 180, and now it's him running away. That was pretty much all there was. It's been about a week and we haven't seen him again. As an update, I did describe the man to police officers and they said they would keep a lookout for him. Not sure who he was, but I'm sure he thought he could get an easy catch. Yeah, that wasn't going to happen. Remind me again why I can't just be left alone while working? Oh, hey there. I'm just venting a little because I have this story I want to share with you all. It's forever changed me, and it reminds me how being nice 
can sometimes get you into a load of trouble. But what sort of creepy encounter could I have that caused this? Well, sit back, because you're in for quite the chilling tale. For quick backstory, I work at a small gas station along the old Highway 66. It's one of those 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, where oftentimes I work during the evening. This was because I went to school during the day. Also, I'm female, 22 years old, and I'm not the most intimidating girl in the world, around 5 foot 3, 110 pounds. Anyways, due to the station being small, oftentimes you're there by yourself. Occasionally, you do get a co-worker who joins you, but it's mostly when they're showing up to their shift. So anyways, let's go back a couple of months. I had been working for about three hours and it was roughly one in the morning. The gas station was empty, apart from a young couple who had entered and were in the process of buying some snacks and other little items. While I was there watching our little TV, I couldn't help but notice this really creepy guy pacing back and forth and staring at me from outside. He was, I'd say, from my best memory in his late 40s, over 6 foot. 250 to 270 pounds. He had a large beard with dirty overalls and a hat. It was strange, but I tried to ignore him. After a couple of minutes from when I saw him, he enters, and he says he needed help pumping air into his tires. We have a little self-service air pumping system people can use free of charge. I tell him all he had to do was squeeze the throttle, but he said he tried that and that it wasn't working. That was strange because I had checked it less than an hour ago. I tell him to try again, but he insists I help him, going on to say that he would talk to my manager for being a bad employee. I should have called him out on his bluff, but whatever. Annoyed, I agreed to help him, but that's not before grabbing my pepper spray I kept next to me. I also told the two customers I would be right back to help them with their purchase. So I follow this dude and we head over to the pump, Sure enough, he has this beat up minivan parked there. So I go ahead and turn my back on him for just a brief moment and I check the air system. It was working, just like I thought. But before I have an opportunity to react, I hear a car door opening. Then moments later, I feel a tight grasp on my arm. Turning around reveals this creep is holding on to me like glue. And he begins pulling me toward the side door he had just opened. I remember fight or flight kicking in, and I chose to bite down so hard I had the taste of iron in my mouth after. Anyways, the creep retreats his arm for just enough time for me to jump away. I then grab my pepper spray from my pocket as he continues to lunge at me. I spray him, but since I was so scared and I was so shaky, I didn't connect properly. Anyways, I booked it and screamed like no tomorrow as I watched the young couple from inside our little store exit with a look of shock. When I turn around, the dude jumps into his minivan and drives away, never to be seen again. To say I was affected by the entire thing is a serious understatement. Unfortunately, by the time police arrived, this guy must have been in another state. It's been over a month, and I now work during the daytime. Also, I now have a taser, so it's an upgrade for my pepper spray. So, yeah, that's it. Ah yes, the night shift. How I used to love it. A time where I could relax and take it easy. Customers were few in between, and I could take the time to watch late night sitcoms and other silly shows on our store TV. Shall I take you back with me? as I retell my scary story? Okay, let me do just that. But a reminder, this happened quite some time ago, but that doesn't mean I haven't forgotten many of the details. Trust me, when you have something such as this happen, you tend to relive it, even some 20 years later. Anyways, it was summertime in the mid-1990s in Northern Wales and I was working at a gas station by myself. Things were pretty boring, all things considered. And apart from a few customers who showed up to fill up their cars, I kept myself occupied by working on some crossword puzzles and listening to some music. At around 2 in the morning, I saw a vehicle park at the front of the store. I only paid attention for a matter of seconds as I received a phone call at the same moment. It was my co-worker calling me to say he was going to be running a little late. 
figures as much. He is always late. Anyways, in my disappointment, I soon realized my friend being late was the least of my concern. You see, a man in a ski mask enters the store with a revolver. He then demands I hand over every last bit of money the gas station had. I sort of just stood there nervously laughing, thinking this was some sort of joke. Okay, sure, whatever, as if you're really a robber. I said something dumb along those lines. This doesn't sit well with the masked man, as he fires a warning shot at a nearby display. That sent chills down my spine, and I began to realize the actual danger I was in. He says something like, This isn't some sort of game, kid. Hand over everything you have, or the last thing you'll ever see is this barrel against your face. Left with no other option, I open the cash register as he has this thing pointed right at me. Hurry it up, I don't have all night. He was growing impatient as I struggled to open the cash register. When I open it, I grab all the money and throw it into a grocery bag. I was just hoping this was it, and he was going to leave. But apparently he wasn't satisfied with the amount of money in the cash register. There has to be more. Tell me you have more money in the back. I'm not playing with you. We did have a safe with extra cash. So I lead him toward it all the while fearing he could have ended me at any time. The next moments felt like an eternity. See, I didn't know the code for the safe as that was only something the boss knew. You see, we were always to go to him to grab the numbers and I didn't have them memorized. I'd only been working there for a month. Anyways, he begins to grow impatient and more angry as I explain I have no way of opening the safe. So he pushes me to the side as he fires at the safe's lock a few times. Eventually, I hear the click of the revolver. I didn't realize it at the time, but this meant he was out of shots. Nevertheless, the safe slowly opens as he grabs as much cash as he could. Here's where it got scary. I honestly thought I was a goner. In one quick motion, he takes the sidearm and has it pressed against me. But then click. Nothing. Again, this meant he was out of rounds. And since he was so focused on robbing the store, he didn't realize he was out. He grunts in frustration, as he then demands I don't tell anybody about what happened. He then runs out of the store, and gets in a van, where I now stand there trying to fight a panic attack. Luckily, I am able to reach the alarm and call police who showed up about 10 minutes later. When they got there, I was still panicking. I was crying, shaking and just going over the ordeal as if it was on repeat in my head. After about an hour, I was able to give the police officers as many details as I could, but due to the ski mask and the poor quality of our security cameras, plus the lackluster investigation that followed, the man was never caught. And as far as I know, he's still at large all these years later, but I really hope that justice was served and he's since been put behind bars.